What's up everybody, Matt Moran here for another weekly update. So there's lots of news to go over this week. The first big story here is about the new four-cylinder Supra that was just officially revealed for America this week. So Toyota revealed a bunch of changes to the Supra here for the 2021 model year. The biggest one being that four-cylinder version. Pricing isn't finalized yet for that, but the specs are. So don't know how much cheaper it's going to be. Um, but it runs the same four-cylinder as the BMW Z4, meaning it's a two liter four cylinder with a twin scroll turbo that does 255 horsepower and 295 pound feet of torque. Still runs only the eight speed ZF automatic, even though technically the four cylinder is compatible with a manual in the Z4 in Europe. So mechanically it's possible to do a manual. Um, also they could do a manual version of the six cylinder just because they have all the parts from other BMWs. But anyway, for right now, still only automatic for all the supers for 2021. Anyway, this four cylinder version though is still pretty quick zero to 60 is five seconds flat which is still way faster than like a BRZ or an 86 or something like that. It's over 200 pounds lighter too than the uh, six cylinder version, weighing in at 3,181 pounds, uh, but still keeps the same 50-50 weight distribution because the engine isn't the only change. So it also uses smaller single piston caliper front brakes instead of the four piston brakes on the front of the six cylinder version. Four cylinder supers also don't have the active differential or the adaptive suspension system from the six cylinder. The wheels are also 18 inches and are cast instead of the forged 19 inch wheels. So that actually adds a little bit of weight, I think, with the cast versus the forged. Um, but the stereo has also been downgraded to a four speaker setup instead of the 10 speaker that's standard in the six cylinder Supra. Uh, so they did strip it out a little bit. It also gets manual seats instead of the power seats that are standard in the six cylinder. Uh, but you can still upgrade the four cylinder with a safety and technology package, which gives you the driver assistance tech, which means you have a adaptive cruise, blind spot monitoring, all that kind of stuff. Um, it'll give you navigation and the 12 speaker JBL stereo and wireless Apple CarPlay if you do uh, want your interior to not be quite as bare bones. Um, they didn't list any pricing for that package though, uh, but they did say that all Supras, four and six cylinder, get the 8.8 .8 inch infotainment screen as standard now. Um, so the six and a half inch screen that was on base Supras for 2020, um, that is being discontinued. You can't get the six and a half inch screen anymore. Um, so that's a nice improvement. Um, and now they didn't give any pricing changes for the six cylinder version either. I'm guessing the fact there's a a little bit more standard equipment and a few other upgrades here, which I'm going to get to in a minute, means that maybe the six cylinder Supra could also go up in price as well. So those of you who already bought a 2020 Supra, don't get too upset whenever you hear about all the other awesome changes for the 21 version. So six cylinder Supra gets, um, there's substantial changes too. Uh, the first being a 47 horsepower jump to 382 horsepower. So it now matches the Z4 M40i version. It also gets three more pound feet of torque now at 368 pound feet. Because of these changes, 0 to 60 has been dropped from a 4.1 second time to 3.9 seconds. The higher horsepower, they say at Toyota, is thanks to a greatly revised engine that has a new dual branch exhaust manifold and a new piston design that lowers the compression ratio from 11 to 1 to 10.2 to 1. Um, and so they say this provides higher torque at um, higher RPM. Handling has also been tweaked for the six cylinder and now has increased roll resistance and enhanced quartering ability thanks to a re tuned chassis uh, and the addition of aluminum strut braces for better lateral rigidity. There's new front and rear bump stops and new damper tuning. All the electronic systems have been retuned as well to take advantage of all the changes. And Toyota says the 21 Supra is more stable through quick transitions such as compound turns. There's also uh, this new A91 edition that they're only making a thousand of. It's only on the six cylinder version and is available in either black or this new blue color called Refraction, which which is exclusive to this edition. So unfortunately, uh, an awesome color, but it's limited to only those uh, limited edition versions. So um, it also gets uh, for this A91 version, uh, a carbon fiber lip spoiler, matte black wheels, um, which I think are the same as the ones on last year's special edition, the launch edition. Uh, but then it also gets these cool C-pillar graphics and carbon fiber mirror caps. Uh, the interior also gets black Alcantara with blue contrast. And uh, so 
all that is uh, very impressive. I mean, for this vehicle only being out for one model year and realistically only being out for, you know, six to nine months to already have a huge jump in power, um, all these improvements in just one model year. It seems like they've kind of learned from the Toyota 86 and the BRZ, which kind of got stale and didn't really get a lot of meaningful updates. Um, they're doing a lot of stuff here to the Supra here, just one model year and we have all these changes. Um, but like I said, all that stuff could drive the price of the six cylinder super up. So again, I would reserve your annoyance if you're a 2020 super owner until uh, you see the new pricing because maybe that'll be higher and will justify the cheaper price of the 2020, even though you get a little bit less power. Um, but that's, that's a nice improvement for 21. So um, fingers crossed we get a manual here down the road. And also I'm hoping they still add an orange color to the Supra uh, considering the awesome orange one that was shown very briefly in the new Fast 9 trailer. I think orange would be totally fitting for the Supra, of course. So we'll have to wait and see. But anyway, awesome changes there. Aston Martin revealed uh, some awesome stuff this week too. The new Vantage Roadster. And in addition to these gorgeous looks, it also has the fastest power folding top of any car in production, going down in 6.7 seconds and up in 6.8 seconds. It speeds up to 31 miles per hour. It's 132 pounds heavier than the coupe and takes 0.2 seconds longer to go 0 to 60, now at 3.7 seconds. Uh, but Aston claims there's no compromise to feel or refinement, um, but the rear dampers, the adaptive damper tuning, and the ESP calibration are unique, as is the tuning for the drive modes. There's also this new vein grill option if you don't like the black mesh grill that was the only option previously. That's available both coupe and convertible. Um, and I think that actually um, does give a little more structure to the grill for those who um, thought the other one was a little too open, but it also loses the ridge around that opening, which I think makes the old version still look a little more aggressive. But cool to have that option if you'd like it. Um, pricing starts at $161,000 for the Roadster, and that's $8,000 more than the coupe. And deliveries are going to be starting here in the United States uh, this summer. Uh, but another quick little vantage uh, bit of news is they've also, along with this, made the announcement that the seven speed manual is now going to be available to order on a standard vantage. Um, for the past few months, it was only available on the vantage AMR version. They did say it was going to come to the regular one here, and so that is something that's happening, I believe, for the 21 model year. And uh, you can already configure one on the Aston Martin configurator if you'd like. So great that they're adding that as well. It's uh, great news that uh, they're keeping the manual alive. And new electric car company Nikola this week revealed their electric pickup truck. Everyone's doing electric pickup trucks. So there's several this week, um, but theirs is called the Badger, and I think it looks very awesome and kind of like what I was hoping the Tesla uh, Cybertruck would look like. But anyway, so this can be available as either a regular battery electric truck or as a hydrogen fuel cell electric truck. So the battery one has 300 miles of range from 160 kilowatt hour lithium ion battery, which is massive. The hydrogen one has 600 miles of range by adding 120 kilowatt fuel cell in addition to the battery pack. So basically they just add that on. So I think this is a really brilliant solution. You know, if you want to have just straight batteries, then go for it and you have 300 miles of range. But if you want to have an unrealistically high amount of range for your electric vehicle, then, you know, you have this hydrogen tank and whenever you need it, you can pop it in. They said it'll go, you can either use both simultaneously or use one or the other. So you could just always use that battery pack and then switch over to the hydrogen for longer trips. And I think that's a brilliant solution actually, um, while still, you know, making it more green than a normal plug-in hybrid with a massive battery and having a huge battery pack I, or having a huge engine to go along with the battery pack. I think doing this makes a lot of sense. All you have to do is have that hydrogen tank and that's it as far as weight and space goes. Anyway, um, I think they're onto something here, but uh, continuing on here, um, they claim their battery pack is tougher than other competitors with their pack supposedly being able to handle temperatures of negative 20 degrees Fahrenheit before it affects the battery performance or range, which is another common complaint with batteries. They can lose up to 40% of their range in most uh, electric vehicles. This supposedly doesn't. It has 906 peak horsepower, but 455 continuous horsepower. Um, so, uh, you know, I think most companies are always reporting that peak number, but it does drop off in electric vehicles. Um, they can't do that forever. Torque is 980 pound feet of torque though, which is crazy. And it has a super capacitor launch system that gives it a 2.9 second zero to 60 time that they say is repeatable because it has that super capacitor. So it's not like it has to warm up the battery just right like the Tesla and stuff. That's also very cool. It can climb 40% grades, 
they say, and can tow over 8,000 pounds as well. Uh, it's about four inches lower than an F-150 as far as the roof and stuff goes, but it's 1.5 inches wider for comparison's sake, and about four inches longer than an F-150 as well. Although despite that extra length, uh, the bed is about three feet shorter, supposedly. So, um, you know, not quite as much of a hauler as the F-150, I suppose, but maybe they'll have longer bed versions, you know, down the road. Uh, but they said it's going to be built in conjunction with another OEM utilizing their certified parts and manufacturing facilities, uh, but wouldn't say what company that is. So um, I'm not sure how that's going to play out. Maybe it's kind of like a Rivian and Ford deal or something. I'm not sure who they would use, but considering they're doing the hydrogen thing, I'm tempted to think that they're going to work with one of the companies that really wants to promote hydrogen stuff, which could be like Hyundai and Kia, could be Honda, even GM, but I think GM's doing their own thing, so I doubt it's them. But, you know, Honda or Kia and Hyundai could use a partnership for a, you know, large truck, uh, potentially. This could be um, kind of convenient. I don't think there'd be any kind of badge engineering or any kind of re branding but you know if you know it can be sold in honda you know, dealerships for example or here hyundai i'm just spitballing here but that i think would make a lot of sense and it sounds like uh, nicola here they're going to be really helping the hydrogen network as well um because they're saying that they plan to put in 700 of their own hydrogen stations across the u.s and they'll be announcing those uh, sometime early this year um so that really would help a lot because there's even in California only a few hydrogen stations um, and it's 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 tough to do. So I think if they really do this the same way Tesla built out their supercharger network, if Nikola builds out a hydrogen network, then they have the best of both worlds. You got the battery electric stuff, which is better than the other batteries supposedly and the competitors. Plus you got the hydrogen thing for a truly green long range version until battery technology uh, improves you know, sometime in the distant future. Uh, but in the meantime, this is a great solution and um, I think this is very brilliant and I think they have a lot of potential as long as they can, again, figure out where they're going to sell their vehicles, where they're going to service their vehicles. All those types of things are still questions that remain to be seen. We also don't know the pricing of it yet. Um, so that's going to be another thing that's going to kind of play out. They did say that um, they're going to be having a conference called Nicola World in 2020, uh, uh, called Nicola World 2020 in September of 2020 here. Um, and they're going to have test units there available. So they should have some actually working vehicles. These pictures you're seeing are just renderings for now. But they are saying they're accepting limited reservations for this year which makes it kind of sound like they're planning to build these by the end of this year. And if they have an OEM partner, that is possible. That would also mean they would be Tesla to the punch as well, uh, along with uh, Rivian beating them too. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, but I'm guessing most of these will be available sometime next year. Um, but I'm really pulling for them because this, I think, is a really brilliant solution. And uh, yeah, fingers crossed that that goes well for them. Um, there's some new rumors this week uh, from Autocar about the next-gen Ford Focus RS. And we probably aren't going to be getting the next-gen RS here in the States because all the Focuses are leaving. And Ford has not given us the new Focus ST that's already been out for over a year now. So I'm guessing we're not going to get the RS version either. But in case you're curious or you're watching in Europe, here's the uh, news here. So originally the new Focus RS was supposed to get uh, an improved version of the current or I guess previous generation 2.3 liter uh, four cylinder turbo combined with a 48 volt mount hybrid system that was gonna bump the power to around 400 horsepower. That plan got scrapped um, with the stricter CO2 regulations coming into effect for 2021 they realized they had to get more aggressive with their emissions cutting than doing just that. So Ford, again, this is all according to this report, nothing confirmed, but supposedly Ford is working on a more electrified approach. Um, and so they're reported to be now considering um, taking the powertrain from the Ford Escape plug-in hybrid we get here in the States, which runs a two and a half liter naturally aspirated engine on the Atkinson cycle. And then uh, that has an electric motor along with it for 221 horsepower or 222 horsepower combined. So basically the Focus RS hypothetically would use a version of this engine that then has a turbo put on it um, and then have that electric motor maybe boosted a little bit to give it uh, around 400 horsepower still. Um, I'm not sure why to, you know, putting a turbo on the two and a half liter engine, which is larger than the 2.3 from the old Focus RS. I don't know how that would make things better as far as emissions go, um, unless maybe, you know, just the 2.3 is an old motor and the 2.5 is newer and just more efficient even with a turbo on it. I don't know. But 
that's the news. We'll have to see, you know, what ends up happening there, but likely, again, sadly, will not affect any of us here in America. Um, but other uh, news for uh, Ford fans in Europe is that Ford just announced that the Mustang Mach-E is going to be available in Europe by late this year as well. So it'll be rolling out at the same time we get it here in North America. Um, and so Ford says they originally set up the Mach-E with Europeans in mind as well, and um, that the European version will have uh, specific tuning to better suit European and roads and things like that um but uh, great that they're going to offer it there as well uh, especially you know europe is even more hungry for evs than i think we are here in the states so um hopefully that does well for them over there um other news from autocar here is that they found an interview on the official porsche media site talking about the history of the porsche 914 but in this interview, they uh, interviewed the current head of Porsche Design, who dropped several strong hints and basically just put it out there that they're working on a new version of the 914. Um, and they just, they're quoted here as saying, um, they interviewed the uh, design chief of Porsche. And he says, we have this discussion all the time, a modern 550, like the Porsche 550 Speedster, a modern version of that in the broadest sense, a very simple, unpretentious car. Uh, there's supposedly two different directions that they're considering according to the article one uh was he said is a car with almost no electrics all everything mechanical puristic the other idea he says is a car for a target group of people who drive audi ttrs's or golf r32s which is very strange examples the you know ttrs makes sense but golf r32s that's an old vehicle the golf r i guess is what he's referring to um considering he's in the volkswagen group i don't know why he said r32 anyway um but something like that just sounds like the current Boxster and Cayman as far as TTRS goes. Those were always competitors, so that doesn't sound like anything too revolutionary. Um, but at least it sounds like it's not electric. If he's talking about something with almost no electrics and totally mechanical, um, sounds like this would be a really back-to-basics uh, type thing, which would be cool. Um, and we do know, I believe it was confirmed. If not, it's, it's heavily rumored that the next-gen Boxster and Cayman are going to be getting just a completely electric powertrain, um, and that's several years off but that's supposedly down the pipeline. Anyway, but it sounds like, you know, those two ideas he was talking about, it sounds like they might blend the two because he continues on by saying, um, sales might see things differently from this standpoint. A much cheaper entry-level Porsche would be the right thing to do, obviously for sales, but that's not my approach, he says. So he described his approach as a puristic, reduced, back to the roots uh, kind of setup and added, I think the time has come that we would be... Uh, typically Porsche again with this idea. So he's kind of uh, suggesting that, you know, it's it, hopefully they do something that really is kind of a bare bones thing that would be very cool. Um, and so supposedly he's already designing this new 914 as well, talking about the design of the old one and then saying about this new one, modern reduced styling. The more I work with nine with the 914, that's exactly what I'm fighting for now. This reduced puristic approach, integrating things, not one line too many. So, sounds like he's well into the work of uh, designing this new 914. It even comes out and calls it a 914. So, leaves very little to the imagination as far as everything here with this new car. Um, you know, what it would be powered by remains to be seen. You know, there was obviously very few people really liked the four-cylinder that Porsche came out with in the 718. Um, but, you know, since the 914 was a four-cylinder model... I could see them trying to redeem the four-cylinder, put it in that, maybe keep the six-cylinder for the Boxer and Cayman for the next few years, something like that. I mean, if they're just designing this 914, though, it sounds like it will be off in the distance. So maybe what their game plan is, is, you know, Boxer and Cayman goes fully electric, but then they have the 914 as the puristic mechanical one for people who still want to cling on to that. Um, and so that would give people kind of a choice. And um, maybe even the 914 could be cheaper, which would be great. And maybe move the Boxer and Cayman a little bit up market. Um, so we'll have to wait and see. But very interesting there. And cool, they just kind of laid it all out there. That's that's awesome. And some other Porsche news. Uh, Evo Magazine supposedly got confirmation from Porsche that the PDK transmission is going to be available to order on the Cayman GT4 and Boxster Spider by the end of this year. Now, Evo is a European magazine, so I'm guessing they're just talking about Europe for 
for now. I'm not sure if the states would get it as well, but I'm guessing we would. Um, currently, you know, the uh, both the GT4 and the Spider are manual only, um, and previous versions of those vehicles never got PDK. Um, they also could eventually, according to Evo, be um, offered for the new 718 GTS models that are going back to that six-cylinder. Um, and since it's basically the same engine as the GT4, just detuned a little bit, that makes a lot of sense. If they're making it work with one, it'll work with the other. Um, it could also bring the 0-60 to 60 times down a good bit and bring those cars into the threes for their 0-60 to 60 times, which would be good as well. I think people really love those cars for the manual, though, but I know there are a few people that still would love to have the PDK and just want the fastest 0-60 to 60 time or don't want to shift for some reason. And so um, it's nice that they give people choices if that's what they're into. So interesting to hear that. Speaking of uh, some new cars that are coming, though, uh, Mercedes officially confirmed two cars debuting this year in its final 2019 financial results. So the next-gen S-Class is the first one coming, supposedly, and should arrive soon. Uh, the other one, they say, is the electric EQA that's going to be launching this fall and will be an electrified version of the GLA crossover that was just revealed you know, a couple months ago. They also say that these are among others, meaning there's going to be several other debuts this year as well, including a refreshed E-Class uh, we know is coming, and probably the next-gen C-Class will debut this year as well. Um, and so they're going to be getting rid of some stuff at Mercedes as well, too, though. So we've heard in the past... Uh, a few months actually that they're going to be you know simplifying their lineup and getting rid of some stuff and they've already gotten rid of some stuff i believe such as convertible versions of the c-class and stuff like that um but uh so what we have here is some new stuff uh comes from german newspaper handelsblatt i hopefully i didn't butcher that but they're claiming that the s-class coupe and cabriolet won't live on for the next gen whenever the next gen version of the s-class arrives this year that it'll just be a sedan and there won't be a cooper convertible anymore and that makes a lot of sense because we've been hearing reports about Mercedes working on a next-gen SL. And I'm like, how are they going to fit an SL in? There's so much overlap right now with the S-Class convertible. Then you have the SL, which is a two-seater. But then you also have, you know, they're saying the SL is going to be sportier. But then you have the AMG GT, which is also sporty. And so... Um, I think maybe this would give the SL a little bit of room to still be the luxurious one, let the AMG GT be the sports car, and that's enough. I don't think they need more than two uh, luxurious uh, sporty convertibles. So I think that makes a lot of sense to get rid of the S-Class Coupe and convertible, as gorgeous and awesome as they are. Um, other stuff, though, is... Um, the newspaper also claims that the CLS and the AMG GT four-door won't be getting a new generation, and once they're done with their life cycle, they'll be gone. Um, and so they're supposedly are, they're going to be replaced by one electric model. I don't know if the EQS is going to be considered the replacement for the CLS or um, you know what it's going to be, but um, you know we'll have to wait and see. Obviously, they're good, doing a lot of new electric cars at Mercedes, and so it'll either be the like I said EQS or something else. We'll have to see, but. Um, very interesting to hear that, especially the CLS has been around for a while, and the AMG GT four-door, that's just a brand new thing. So the fact they're already losing hope in that, supposedly, um, you know, could mean that I... I've been saying for a long time, Mercedes has a lot of overlap. All the German car companies have way too many models. And so simplifying things, I think, will certainly help. And so um, interesting to hear that. Um, Kia this week has teased the 2021 Sorento officially, and it basically shows us most of the crossover here already, including its interior. Um, so leaves very little uh, to the imagination. So it looks great, though, I think. In typical Kia fashion, they really been knocking it out of the park with their uh, designs, both the exterior and the interior. Uh, but the full reveal is going to be happening in Geneva early next month with the American debut probably happening in New York in April. Um, but yeah, looks very impressive and looking forward to hearing more on that. Hyundai also teased the 2021 i30 that it'll be debuting in Geneva um, and will likely be getting the same styling on the 2021 Elantra GT. That's our version of the i30. Um, and that again could debut in New York. And so it looks much more aggressive here from the one teaser shot than the current model, um, which has more mild styling currently. Uh, but this is just a refresh. So don't expect any dramatic changes as far as the size of the vehicle or anything like that. Um, but according to Hyundai, the interior is going to be getting the latest tech, including options for digital gauges and the 10.25 inch touchscreen infotainment system from the other newest Hyundai models should be in there. Um, it also appears that Hyundai is working on an electric hatchback as well, uh, a production version of the 45 concept they showed us last fall. So I will link the pictures in the description below. I don't have the rights to show you those pictures, but um, 
if you're curious and you want to go over and click click over, um, basically it's very heavily camouflaged. You can't tell much aside from the fact that it's a, a vehicle that looks to be about the size of the Elantra GT, um, but is electric supposedly. And Autoblog speculates it'll be using the Kona electric setup, which certainly makes sense to just you know copy and paste that over. And so that would mean it would have about 201 horsepower from a front electric motor for front wheel drive and a 64 kilowatt hour battery for well over 200 miles of range. And that all sounds good to me. I mean, if it looks half as cool as the concept does uh, and they bring it to the US actually, it could be a really cool retro substitute for the Honda E that Honda is giving to the rest of the world, but not to us for some frustrating reason, even though many Americans uh, seem to want it. Um, so if Honda won't do it, maybe Hyundai will. We'll have to wait and see. That would be nice of them. And it looks like from the spy shots, it looks fairly far along. So hopefully we don't have much longer to wait for that. So anyway, cool to see that. Other Hyundai EV news though is that they just announced a partnership with Canoe which is a startup company that has built a proprietary skateboard style electric vehicle platform uh, this is similar to like what Volkswagen has with their platform and Rivian has their platform and those of both you know Volkswagen and Rivian both partnered with Ford and there's other partnerships like this as well outside of those companies but both Hyundai and Kia will supposedly get models that use this platform as well as what they call purpose-built vehicles um, so that likely means commercial style stuff which you can see all the promo pictures here of this uh, van, uh, something like that. But I'm not sure if this, uh, you know, Hyundai 45 thing that uh, was spied, if that'll be using this platform or if that's too soon. And, you know, maybe this will be on more uh, far out stuff in a few years. But uh, anyway, cool to hear about that nonetheless. And continuing on with the EV news here, it sounds like uh, at Volkswagen, the Passat could get replaced with an electric sedan once this generation is done. Um, so Volkswagen's chief operating officer told Roadshow that the Passat is a car that has a finite lifespan in terms of our planning and continued by saying it's probably a reasonable assumption that when this Passat reaches the end of its life cycle, its successor will probably not feature an internal combustion engine. So this likely means the end of the Passat name and sadly will probably be replaced by some generic ID name since that's what they're doing with all these new electric vehicles. I don't know why Volkswagen is getting rid of all their great names um, just to do some blank thing. Uh, just, you know, I'm guessing this one will be called ID5 considering ID three and four, the three is a hatchback, the four is an SUV. Um, who knows what they'll do with the other stuff. But anyway, um, and so it'll likely look similar to the ID Vision concept, which was from several years ago. So it seems like they've been planning an electric sedan for a while. Uh, and the Passat was just refreshed again here for 2020, and I'll be driving it next month, actually. So stay tuned for a review on that if you're curious um, of what might be likely the last uh, Passat. But um, this generation Passat, you know, it's... It, it's been around since I think like 2012, the 2012 model year. So actually 2011 technically. Um, so I have a hard time believing it's going to last um, for more than another two years considering this refresh um, is already not super impressive. I saw it already at the New York Auto Show last year um, and it still seems a little dated on the inside. So I don't see this lasting more than two years or so. And considering the concept um, for this electric one's been in the works for several years now, I'm guessing after the SUV launches here this year for Volkswagen, um, an electric sedan probably will come soon after. Anyway, uh, if you love Passats, get one while you can because they might not uh, be around much longer. Um, General Motors, uh, their president, Mark Russ, uh, revealed to investors last week that the GMC Hummer EV is going to have at least three different powertrains. And we figured it probably would have several. Uh, but it's just interesting to get the confirmation here. So um, he said, when we go to market, we'll have one, two, or three motor versions offering different ranges, different performance, and different price points to meet customers wherever they may be. If the customer wants a basic package, we'll have that. If the customer wants true off-road capability and towing capacity, we'll have that too. So this likely means we're going to have rear-wheel drive and all-wheel drive versions of this Hummer, which will be cool. He also revealed that it, of course, won't be the only model to get this even tech of course they're going to be sharing it and uh, he says um, we'll have a complete lineup of evs including the hummer and its stable mates um, so the most likely candidates for the other things that will get this platform are a chevy pickup um, possibly an ev version of the escalade or you know cadillac has their exclusive electric crossover they teased uh, over a year ago maybe that's going to get this platform um, we'll have to see um, but anyway uh, you know interesting to get that confirmation and fisker this week teased their electric pickup truck 
Mark in a supposedly accidental tweet by the company's founder, um, which reveals the name Alaska here, you can see, and also the back end styling. But it was quickly taken down, um, even though the tweet doesn't seem accidental from you know the text there saying electric pickup. Like, um, I'm not sure how, how do you accidentally tweet something like that? Like you type it out, you attach an image, and then you hit tweet. Like, how do you do that by accident? Um, seems kind of weird. Uh, so I think this might just be a publicity stunt or something. They don't have all the official reveals, you know, stuff ready, but with um, that Badger coming from Nikola and all the other stuff with GMC and Tesla, I'm sure Fisker's like, hey, don't forget about us too. And uh, I think that's kind of what this was, if uh, I'm guessing. But um, I'm sure we'll see some type of official reveal relatively soon, you know, maybe in the next few months or something. Um, but anyway, interesting to see that. Lastly, uh, for the, some non-EV news, Mazda is finally bringing the diesel engine um, from that they've been teasing uh, finally for the Mazda 6 year, uh, supposedly this year. So according to a CARB certification that Autoblog found, it sounds like the diesel Mazda 6 will be coming um, actually for the 2020 model year, because that's what it's listed out on the CARB uh, documentation. I mean, we're already halfway through the 2020 model year, so this thing should be coming like in the next day or two if they're going to be trying to sell it as a 2020. Um, and so it reveals in this document it's going to be a 2.2 liter turbo diesel, just like in the CX-5. Same motor, same transmission, six-speed auto. No surprises there. It doesn't reveal if it's going to be front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Supposedly it's available with all-wheel drive in Europe. Um, and they talked about doing an all-wheel drive version of the Mazda 6, but here in the States, they're all front-wheel drive, so I'm assuming it'll stay front-wheel drive unless they're using the diesel to roll out the all-wheel drive option, maybe. Um, but I wouldn't hold my breath for that. But um, anyway, uh, that's interesting, you know, for those who are into that, but I feel like they're just really behind with the diesel thing. I don't know who would be interested in that. The diesel CX-5 supposedly isn't selling very well at all, um, understandably so. And so, uh, yeah, I don't know why they're even bothering with this, honestly, but um, hey, they said they were going to do it and they're doing it so i respect them for keeping to their word um also last week there was a patent that was found that was confirming that mazda is working on an inline six as well as an eight speed automatic i didn't cover that story but a few of you commented i didn't cover it because uh mazda officially already announced that they're doing an inline six in their financial um some financial report that they had like in the middle of last year so if you're curious to hear more about that inline six i will link above the weekly update where i already discussed that in length um there isn't really anything new here in this um, you know patent aside from I think it's going to have like an integrated exhaust manifold or something like that otherwise nothing new to report there but just wanted to mention that in case people thought I missed that anyway uh, that's it as far as all the news this week guys so lots of big stories here let me know what you think about everything in the comments below thank you guys very much for watching and I'll see you on the next one take care